Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive at one of the most difficult jobs on earth. I'm your host, Mark Minkus. I want to ask you a couple of questions about the students at your school. Do some of your students give up easily when faced with a challenging problem or concept? Are your students sometimes too worried about looking smart? Do any of your students get really upset when they make a mistake on an assignment or just get a question wrong on a test? I think this is a pretty common problem in our private schools. And one reason is because some of our children have been told all of their lives, you are so smart by their parents. And many of our students just cruise along with their natural intelligence until they come up against a concept that they've never seen before and wham, they shut down and they cry. And I've seen students literally slide the piece of paper back across the desk to the teacher and say, I can't do this. So do you want to know how to fix this problem at your school? Well, I've watched this problem almost disappear at our school and we've been able to sustain this change for over six years. And we spent zero dollars on this change. But most importantly, I've heard a fourth grader say, wow, now I don't have to keep acting smart. So if you're curious about how you can make this transformation take place at your school, keep listening, and we're going to dive into this topic together and give you some really practical tools and resources for you to use. To start things off, though, I want to tell you a story. The day began like any other day at school. It was a Thursday morning, and the leaves were starting to change outside the window of the fourth grade homeroom class. A fourth grade student walked up and just stood quietly in front of his teacher's desk, and with no expression and a matter-of-fact tone of voice, he said, I don't have a pencil. And then he just stood there. And the boy stood there for some time, quietly waiting for someone to solve his problem. And with a smile, his teacher said, well, what are two ways that you could solve that problem for yourself? And the fourth grader stood there for a while, and then he walked away and was eventually able to borrow a pencil from a classmate. This anecdote was shared at our next intermediate school team meeting. And other teachers quickly chimed in with similar stories about how their students seemed to want us to solve their problems for them. And further conversation led to discussions about how students would often shut down or just flat out refuse to try a difficult task. And many students would ask questions at every single step in the process, needing to receive constant feedback and approval. That was six years ago that that fourth grader stood in front of his teacher's desk waiting for someone else to solve his problem. And we now call it the pencil incident. And that was the exact moment when the transformation at our school began. So right after the pencil incident, we spent the rest of that school year having discussions as an intermediate school team and we brainstormed and we concluded that our students had developed a bad case of learned helplessness. And after many more conversations, we finally agreed on the bigger problem and that was that our students lacked resilience. So let's just pause for a minute before we go on. I want to just quickly paint this picture for you again. We were seeing all the things that I mentioned earlier in our students. They would shut down when a task became too difficult. They were worried about looking smart, and most of them would give up easily when they faced something that was too difficult, and they were embarrassed about making mistakes, and they would just not try sometimes. Well, as a team we determined that we were going to find the best way to build resilience in our students. And all of our conversations and all of our brainstorming and our research led us to Carol Dweck and growth mindset. So about 30 years ago, Stanford University psychologist Dr. Carol Dweck and her colleagues began researching attitudes about failure. And those findings led to more research that showed a student's underlying beliefs or mindset about learning and intelligence significantly impacted motivation and achievement. So let's hold up there for a second. This is huge. The way that a child believes that learning takes place impacts how they learn and how hard they try and for how long they try. So what they believe about how they learn influences 
how long they try and how hard they try. And in her book called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, Carol Dweck says, no matter what your ability is, effort is what ignites that ability and turns it into accomplishment. So let that just sit with you for a second. Effort ignites ability. And so Carol Dweck coined the terms growth mindset and fixed mindset to provide a frame for her research that could be more easily understood. So I want to take a few minutes and give you the basic framework of a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, and then we'll spend the majority of this episode talking about how you can implement an intentional plan at your private school to teach growth mindset to your kids. And I'm also going to give you everything that you need to do this at your school for free, including Google Docs, Google Slideshows, and also I have a free webinar that is about 50 minutes long for your teachers that you could use as kind of a plug and play PD. And so everything that you'll hear on this episode has been kind of packaged into a webinar that's for teachers and then all the resources will accompany that. And all that's available over at the privateschoolleader.com slash episode four. So I'm going to take good care of you with all the resources that you need. So just listen and kind of take all of this in and then ultimately you're going to have to decide, is this something that you want to do at your school? All right. So now that you know that you're going to be well taken care of, just again, let, let this sink in and just listen. So I'm going to hit you with another quote from Carol Dweck's book. She said, in a growth mindset, people believe that their most basic abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work. Brains and talent are just the starting point. This view creates a love of learning and a resilience that is essential for great accomplishment, end quote. So students with a growth mindset, they tend to embrace challenges, persist in the face of obstacles, and they see effort as the path to mastery. In math class, the, for example, these students are the ones who will attempt a problem that they've never seen before rather than obsess over getting it right or not wanting to make a mistake and just shutting down. And these are your students that recognize that mistakes are opportunities for growth and that those mistakes don't define them. And children who adopt a growth mindset feel comfortable making mistakes and learning from them. So let's stop there for a second. Would you say that the majority of your students feel comfortable making mistakes? Something to think about. I know the answer at our school six years ago was no. We didn't have children who were comfortable making mistakes, and they were, they were stuck. They were paralyzed by it. And so I want to ask you another question. How would your school change if your students saw mistakes as a thing that helped them learn Instead, instead of something that defined them as a failure or as not smart. So let me ask you that question again. How would your school change if your students saw mistakes as something that helped them learn instead of something that defined them as a failure or as not smart? And we'll talk later about how we have too many students in our private schools that have their personal view of themselves and their self-worth tied up in their academic achievement and how many problems come from that. So this idea of effort leading to persistence and embracing challenges and that mistakes are opportunities, all of that goes along with a growth mindset and the idea that um, talent and brains and ability are just the starting point and that dedication and hard work can lead to more achievement. So on the other hand, students with a fixed mindset believe their talents, abilities, and intelligence are fixed. They think they're fixed traits, that when they were born, they got a certain amount of intelligence, a certain amount of ability in math or in certain subjects or um, with a musical instrument, they either have it or they don't have it. They believe that was fixed. And they believe that success is possible with talent alone. And these students tend to have a desire to look smart. And as a result, unfortunately, they often avoid challenge, give up easily in the face of obstacles, and see effort as a waste of time. Why bother? 
And these students might also say, well, I'm not good at math, or I'm not really a math person, or I don't know how to play basketball. I'm terrible at playing this musical instrument. And this way of thinking offers a built-in excuse to put forth less effort and give up easily when faced with a problem that seems too difficult. So an excuse equals less effort, or a fixed mindset equals less effort, and then they're stuck. And we sometimes are like that in our lives, too, that if we complain about something, then it gives us an excuse to put forth less effort. But here we are. We've defined growth mindset. We've defined fixed mindset. But now we need to talk about pedestal kids. And pedestal kids are what some writers refer to as kids that have a fixed mindset and they've been put on a pedestal by parents and teachers who have told them, you're so smart for their entire lives. Now, it's not their fault that they're on the pedestal because someone else put them there. But at some point, these children realize that they're on the pedestal because they are smart and they never want to get knocked off the pedestal by a mistake or an academic failure. And so, consequently, some of our brightest students shut down when something is just beyond their grasp. And they just don't put in that effort because if they quit, they're never exposed as not being intelligent and they get to stay on the pedestal. So does that make sense? They're on the pedestal because of what they've been told their whole life and they've cruised along with their intelligence, maybe through lower school, but then they hit intermediate school or middle school and they start to come up against things that they haven't seen before and they don't want to be exposed as not smart and so they shut down rather than try. And I want you to just let that sink in for a second and I want to ask you, can you stop and picture a pedestal kid at your school? Can you picture more than one? Can you picture five? Can you picture a dozen pedestal kids at your school? Well, I believe it's our responsibility, and I feel strongly that we have a real responsibility to help our students develop a growth mindset, because the pedestal kid thinking is only going to have them put forth less effort and shut down and have anxiety about academics and all of the other things that we see in our private schools. But this shift will impact far more than just how they learn and their level of success The much more important piece of this is is that they're going to feel more emotionally safe at school and then they're going to have a better life. And I told you before about a student that said something after they heard a growth mindset mini lesson. And it was about two years ago and it was um, the first day of school or the first week of school and we had just concluded our first growth mindset mini lesson with the fourth graders And at the end of the lesson, a nine-year-old turned to his teacher and said quietly, wow, now I don't have to keep acting smart. Nine years old, I don't have to keep acting smart. So this is about way more than getting problems right or wrong on a test. This is about severe anxiety and mental health issues and eating disorders and other problems that years down the road, develop in the lives of kids that tie their self-worth to their level of academic achievement at school. And so do you have kids like this at your school? Of course we do. And we saw this and we decided we needed to do something about it. So I'm going to teach you how to teach this at your school. But like I said before, I want you to just relax and listen. I'm taking good care of you in the show notes and everything that I talk about that we use to teach growth mindset at our school and have seen this transformation over the past six years. All you have to do is just let it sink in. And as I said before, the show notes over at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode four will be there for you. Okay, so we've set the frame for growth mindset and fixed mindset and identified some of the reasons why this is important. And so the rest of the episode is just going to be about how to effectively teach growth mindset in your school. And at our school, we've been really successful in creating a growth mindset culture in fourth through eighth grade. And I would say that it's part of the circulatory system of our intermediate and middle school. It's not just some add-on that 
the kids roll their eyes, but it's language that they've adopted and it's a mindset and a culture that they have immersed themselves into and the teachers as well. And so there are five ways, and again, the rest of the episode, we're going to focus on how do we do this. There are five areas that we're going to focus on. Number one, scope. Number two, environment. Number three, language. Number four, teaching brain plasticity. And number five, mini lessons. All right, so let's get started. How do we do this? So first of all is scope. We all know that we're much more likely to succeed at a difficult task if we do that same task with other like-minded individuals. That's why people join health clubs to get in shape. And it has less to do with the ellipticals and the free weights, and it has a lot more to do with the fact that the person on your left is also trying to drop 10 pounds. So this is going to be easier to do in your school if more than one person adopts it. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, we, we don't want to try this in the whole school. Well, maybe you want to try it in a division or in a grade or in one department. But the larger the scope, the easier it will be to implement growth mindset with your students because at our school, students go from class to class in intermediate school and in, and in middle school, and they hear the same language, they see the same posters, they have that same growth mindset message reinforced throughout the day, and our intermediate and middle school teachers are like a broken record about growth mindset. So maybe you can't get your entire school behind this goal, and maybe that seems too ambitious to start, but what if you just started small with, like I said, one grade or one department or one division in your school? Listen, what we do is emotional work, and this is going to be challenging. There's going to need to be a lot of activation energy expended to get this rolling, and there will be setbacks, but I just can't stress enough how important this is and how life-changing it can be for your kids and for your school, and someone has to lead this change, and it has to start somewhere, and it can start with you as the leader because you are the person that's in charge of creating and maintaining the culture in your school or your division. So you can decide whether or not you're going to teach growth mindset at your school and the scope of that teaching. So number one is scope. Number two is environment. The only way that growth mindset can really gain a foothold in the classrooms at your school is if your teachers intentionally create an emotionally safe space for your students where they know it's okay to fail. I'm going to talk later about celebrating mistakes and the importance of mistakes being okay to develop a growth mindset. Well, if that's the case, then that means zero tolerance for snide remarks or snickering or sighs or eye rolls from students who get a concept the first time and they're annoyed that the teacher has to go over it again for another student or laughing when someone gets a, an answer incorrect. Growth mindset can germinate and blossom and thrive in your school, but only if your classrooms are a safe space in which students can make mistakes. My guess is most of your classrooms are probably like that anyways. But in order to really intentionally teach growth mindset, you have to take what you have and kind of put it on steroids as far as that emotionally, emotional safety and those safe spaces. Another powerful way to create a growth mindset environment is with posters, which are a low cost or a free way to reinforce this important message. So I'm not talking about going out and spending hundreds of dollars on pre-made posters from a school supply store. I'm talking about go to Google and just Google growth mindset posters and then print them on your school's copier and hang them up in the classroom. Are your students into Star Wars or LeBron James or Taylor Swift or um, the best athlete in your city um, or the most popular Disney uh, network star right now? Um, of course they are. There's a growth mindset poster for all of those things. And if you don't believe me, just Google growth mindset Star Wars or growth mindset LeBron James and you'll see what I mean. So environment, emotional safety, and then also Googling growth mindset 
um, and then fill in the blank with popular characters from movies or what have you, and you'll be amazed at the kind of quotes that you find, and then print those off and you can hang them up in the classrooms. So number one is scope, number two is environment, and number three on how to effectively teach growth mindset at your school, number three is language. So we know that what we say and how often we say it will have by far the largest impact on whether our students will shift from a fixed to a growth mindset. And at our school, I'm very thankful that our teachers have become experts in saying the right thing. And I'll give you a few examples. First of all, praise. So our fourth through eighth grade teachers will never praise a student for intelligence or ability. They won't. But they will heap praise on students for displaying effort and stamina and resilience and a new strategy and just sticking with something. And at our school, you're not going to hear a teacher say, you are so smart or something that emphasizes abilities. I have conversations with with kids at lunch and recess all the time as young as nine-year-old fourth graders, and I'll say to them, I don't care if you're smart. I care if you know how to work hard or if you can stick with something for a long time. And it may take some time for your teachers to transition into this process praise mentality, but it's incredibly powerful. So just think about that phrase, process praise mentality mentality and that we when when the kids start to realize that they're getting praised for effort and sticking with something and not praised for getting it right or for being so smart then we've started to normalize that you're getting praised for effort as opposed to being praised for right answers and process praise can be tricky but there are helpful resources available and specifically in the show notes the very last entry is a Google Doc that has tons of examples of words that you can use when giving process praise, whether it's verbally in person or when you're writing an email or comments on the report card. Another powerful thing with language is the power of the word yet. The word yet. So help students at your school develop an important habit and it will impact every area of their lives. And that habit is to put the word yet at the end of a sentence. So, for example, I have no idea what I'm doing on the basketball court, yet. I'm not good at math, yet. Do you require your students to use precise math vocabulary? Of course you do. Do you require your students to speak respectfully to each other? Of course you require that at your school. Well, you can also require them to put the word yet at the end of a sentence that they use when they describe themselves negatively or when they describe a negative um, self-limiting belief about a certain class or a certain activity. And what it does is it immediately shifts the focus from what is, which is a fixed mindset, to what is possible with hard work, which is a growth mindset. It shifts their mindset from, I'm just not good at this, to, well, I'll give it a try. And your teachers can model this strategy for them with words and remind them when they slip up and in no time at all the kids and the teachers will be just naturally putting yet at the end of all of these sentences and i want to give you a quick story about the power of the words that a teacher says when it comes to growth mindset so i want to go back about five years ago and every year we have a faculty versus eighth grade basketball game in february And about five years ago, one of our intermediate school teachers, her name's Miss R, she was talking to the fifth graders the day before the game. And Miss R was going to play in the game. And she said, I'm no good at basketball. I probably won't even make one basket. And the fifth graders immediately called her out on it. And they said, Miss R, that is not a growth mindset. And so one of the fifth grade girls made a sign that said, go, Miss R, all you need is one basket, just one. That's what the sign said. Go, Miss R. All you need is one basket, just one. And then the fifth graders waved that sign in the stands during the game the next day. Well, Miss R didn't make a basket that year, but she hung the sign up in her room as a keepsake. Now, that would be a nice little story and a nice memory if the story just ended there. But then something amazing happened. One year later, that girl, now in sixth grade, 
The girl that had made the sign, she showed up at the door of Miss R's classroom on the day of the faculty basketball game and asked to borrow the sign. So now the sixth grader sits in the stands with her classmates and cheers on Miss R. And then that year, Miss R didn't make a basket in the game either. So now another year goes by and the same girl now in seventh grade shows up at Miss R's classroom door on the day of the game and asks for the sign. And the sign, remember, says, go Miss R, all you need is one basket, just one. And so the seventh grader sat in the stands with her friends and waved the sign and cheered every time Miss R touched the ball. And you know what happened? Miss R didn't make a basket that year either. So another year goes by. And now the girl's in eighth grade, and it's an eighth grade versus faculty basketball game, so she's going to be playing in the game. But just like every other year, she shows up at the door of Miss R's classroom and says, can I have the sign? And she goes to the gym and hands it to some of the seventh graders that are sitting in the stands watching the game. And that sign that says, go Miss R, all you need is one basket, just one, is at the game while the girl who made the sign way back in fifth grade is playing in the game against Miss R. And during the third quarter, Miss R grabbed a rebound, threw a quick shot at the basket, and it went in. And the eighth grade girls on the court at the time, including the girl who made the sign, cheered and high-fived, and they practically stopped the game because they were all celebrating during the game because Miss R had finally made that basket. And after the girl, the girl, excuse me, after the game, the girl that had made the sign way back in fifth grade, she found the sign, she tore the sign in half, and then she and Miss R posed together for a photo. And I've never seen bigger smiles. Miss R with the girl that made the sign that said, You just need one basket, just one. And the teacher had become the student, and the lesson was growth mindset. Words that we use as adults with the students are incredibly powerful. So what are some other things that you can say? Well, something that we say often is failure is not a permanent condition. That's powerful. We tell them you can actually get smarter by failing at something and then trying again with a different strategy and more effort. We say you might be struggling, but you're making progress. I see your growth in dot, dot, dot in this area. We emphasize the productive struggle, and I put productive struggle in air quotes, but we don't necessarily use that phrase with the kids, but that's a mind that that phrase really helps the teachers to keep in mind what we're doing, the productive struggle. And also we remind our teachers to share their own growth mindset moments because the students tend to think that their teacher has always had it all together. And we know that none of us have it all together. So we encourage our teachers to share their most relatable uh, stories about overcoming something in their life that was a big challenge but that with effort and resilience that they persevered. And those stories are powerful and they humanize their teachers, but then they also motivate the students to have that growth mindset. Okay, last thing on the section about language and the things that we say, and that is we celebrate mistakes at our school. And it may sound corny, but we make a really big deal about celebrating mistakes. And so for instance, Our teachers will say, that was the best mistake that I've seen all day. Or, Olivia, that was a fantastic mistake. Let's see what we can learn from this. Or, I expect you to make mistakes. It's the kinds of mistakes that you make that show me how to support you. And what we've seen is that normalizing mistakes, that it increases their effort, and the students who used to get anxious or paralyzed by even thinking about making a mistake... Now they just dive in and they give it a try. And that's really what we're after. So this section on language, just the things that we say, the power of the word, uh, putting the word yet at the end of a sentence, the process praise, the uh, story about Miss R and just emphasizing how important it is what the teachers say, the um, things that we say about failure is not a permanent condition, and also celebrating mistakes. Those are all tied up in this language section that we talked about. 
Okay, so we're almost there. The five ways to teach growth mindset at your school. Number one, scope. Number two, environment. Number three, language. And number four, teach brain plasticity. Okay, so it may seem like nine and 10 year olds might be too young to learn about neuroplasticity. But actually what we've found is, is that they intuitively understand almost immediately that the brain is like a muscle that gets stronger the more that you use it. And the way that that happens almost immediately is we ask them, have you ever, have you always been able to ride a bike? And well, they'll say no. And then you ask them, well, how did you learn how to ride a bike? Well, and they think about it. And of course we think back to how we learned how to ride a bike and we tried and we fell and we had someone sort of guide us and we finally, and then all of a sudden everything clicked and then we started to pedal and we got it. And then we just ride down the street. Well, what was happening while we were learning how to ride a bike is brain plasticity. We were making new neural pathways of the muscle memory and the coordination and all the things that go together, balance and vision to ride a bike. And that neural pathway was created through repetition, failure and effort. And everything that we do that creates a new neural pathway through neuroplasticity is through repetition, failure, and effort. And isn't that what we want our kids to know? And so what we found was that if they learned how the brain works, that they understand it, and it actually makes them more motivated to try because then they see that learning something like math or playing an instrument or playing basketball is like learning how to ride a bike. And falling down and making mistakes is just part of the learning process. So there are a lot of available resources and specifically, um, I have a couple videos linked in the show notes. And as the students begin to understand neuroplasticity, brain plasticity, they, we've seen them just change their perception about their own abilities and become more likely to embrace the mistakes and just take on the challenges because neural pathways are created through repetition, failure, and effort. Repetition, failure, and effort. So we teach them about brain plasticity. So number one, scope. Number two, environment. Number three, language. Number four, teach about brain plasticity. And number five, growth mindset mini lessons. So Teachers are always struggling with a wide range of issues that are beyond their control, and one of that is the clock on the wall. Insufficient time to get everything done. And we have so much curriculum that we need to cover. Parents are needy, students are needier, and some would say, well, growth mindset isn't on the standardized achievement tests. And so maybe there's the temptation to like set that aside, and well, we're not going to do that because we just don't have time. Well, as a private school leader, I know that you have to keep a close eye on how you're allocating time in class, and there's all kinds of pressure to do different things. But that said, the five growth mindset mini lessons that we use at our school are only 15 minutes each. So 15 minutes times five lessons is 75 minutes, and that 75 minutes will give you a return on investment in your school or your division or that grade that is profound. And if you just invest that 75 minutes over the course of five weeks, 15 minutes a week, everything else that's mentioned in this podcast episode happens during the course of your regular teaching. The posters are on the wall. The language happens during the process of education. So we're not talking about a standalone thing or an assembly or some guest speaker coming in. We're talking about something that is introduced very briefly And then it's reinforced throughout the day from teacher to teacher, from class to class. And so the mini lessons that we've created at our school are lesson number one, introduction to growth mindset. Lesson number two, neuroplasticity. Lesson number three, self-talk. Lesson number four, persistence, resilience, and grit. And lesson number five, review and application. And those five mini lessons are in Google Doc form, and they're available at the privateschoolleader.com slash episode four. There's also the Google slideshows that go with them. They have the links to a couple of different videos that go with it. 
there's guided notes. And again, you could spend longer on this if you wanted to, but we've been able to get those lessons done in about 15 minutes, maybe a few minutes more than that. We would pick like a Wednesday morning and have it be, let's say, Wednesday second period for the first five weeks of school. We're going to do our first first 15 minutes of second period is going to be our growth mindset mini lesson, and we do it. And then we just go on with our day and then we incorporate all of the rest of those things into the day. So I know it sounds like a lot, but let's just break it down and focus on the big takeaways. You now have the ability to transform your school with growth mindset. That's just a fact. You have this ability and you have to decide if you want your pedestal kids to have the opportunity to turn into gritty kids. And you are now armed with the knowledge of why teaching growth mindset is so important for your students. And you have access to many lessons and other resources for your teachers. And it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. And as I've said a few times now, you can find those free resources in the show notes at private school leader, the private school slash episode four. And I call it a plug and play PD. It's a 50 minute webinar that has everything that you just heard, but it's presented to the teachers. And that could be used at a faculty meeting. It could be used as a training. It could be used in a variety of different ways, but you can decide. And then there's guided notes to go along with that webinar. And they'll have the information that you've just heard in this episode And then they'll have the other resources, such as the mini lessons, to be able to quickly implement that at the school. So now you have a decision to make. You know that this is important. You know that your kids will benefit from learning growth mindset. And you now have the resources to do it for free. So what are you going to do with this information? Well, I urge you to take action And just take the next step, just one step, and look at the resources in the show notes. Your kids need this. Your kids deserve this. And it's all there for you. And I just urge you to just take one step and just take a look. So just to wrap it up, I hope that you got value from this episode. The Private School Leader Podcast exists to help you thrive and not just survive at one of the most difficult jobs in the world. And from one private school leader to another... I know that you have a very, very difficult job and you have very specific issues that you face at your school. And my goal is to take my 30 years of experience and just try to be practical with this podcast so you can learn how to grow as a leader, but also get some tools and strategies that you can use right away. So head on over to theprivateschoolleader.com and check out the free resources there. You can listen to the Private School Leader podcast on Amazon, or Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and a new episode of the Private School Leader Podcast comes out every week. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, look for at the Private School Leader. If you got value from this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and share it with one other leader at your school or an aspiring leader at your school. And I've been your host, Mark Minkus. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for taking some of your precious time to join me here today. And I'll see you on the next episode of the Private School Leader Podcast. But until then, always remember to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.